Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to day two of World Justice Forum 4. Uh, I'm Jim Silkenet, a uh, member of the Board of Directors of the World Justice Project and uh, incoming uh, president uh, next month of the American Bar Association. Really delighted that you could all join us here again this morning. Uh, <clears throat> we got off to a wonderful start yesterday uh, with our meetings uh, and the substantive discussions that followed throughout the day. Uh, I was particularly impressed with the engagement of all of our group um, uh, on our important rule of law issues during the reception at uh, City Hall last night. Uh, today we have a very full agenda that will move the ball forward uh, well past where we were at the end of the day yesterday. Uh, thank you for your enthusiasm and involvement so far. Our schedule today uh, is as follows. Uh, after a keynote presentation this morning, uh, there will be a, an important panel discussion on several of the rule of law programs that have been sponsored by the World Justice Project and other entities uh, over the past year or two. Uh, important to see how these initiatives uh, work out, how they're started, how they're uh, completed. Then we will move to part two of our justice incubator working sessions, uh, where we will each return to uh, the sessions we participated in at the end of the day yesterday. After lunch, uh, we will move to our second set of concurrent topical panels, uh, including artists and the rule of law, disaster relief, economic and legal empowerment, uh, food justice, uh, the role of the military in rule of law issues, and sustainable water solutions. Uh, this will be followed at 4.30 uh, by a special keynote conversation on women, women leadership in the rule of law led by Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Finally, we will have our evening salon sessions uh, tonight, uh, where we will have a chance uh, over uh, coffee and refreshments uh, to delve a little deeper into some of the important substantive issues uh, that we've uh, developed uh, earlier in the day. So that is our set of tasks uh, for today. And as Bill Newcomb indicated yesterday, there is a lot of good work for us to do, and we will be doing it today. Our keynote presentation for this morning is a uniquely important one for this conference uh, by um, Justice Song Sang Hyung president of the International Criminal Court uh, here in The Hague. Justice Song has been a judge at the court since 2003 and president of the court uh, since 2009. For more than 30 years, he was a professor of law at Seoul National University in Korea. Justice Song has extensive uh, experience in the relevant areas of international law uh, concerning international human humanitarian law and human rights law. He is co-founder of the Legal Aid Center for Women and of the Childhood Leukemia Foundation in Seoul, and he is uh, president of UNICEF Korea. Please join me in welcoming President Song. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my honor to give a keynote at this fourth World Justice Forum. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the World Justice Project for this opportunity to address some of the most dedicated people working to advance the rule of law around the world. Today, I would like to speak to you about the institution I represent, the International Criminal Court, also known by the abbreviation ICC. The ICC is self-standing independent international organization separate from the United Nations and also entirely separate from the International Chamber of Commerce or International Critic Council, which go by the same acronym. 
to make my remarks as relevant as possible for this forum, I'm going to discuss the ICC's role in strengthening the international rule of law. I will argue that the ICC and its founding treaty, the Rome Statute, have become a leading international paradigm for the enforcement of international legal norms aimed at outlawing and preventing mass atrocities. But first, allow me to take you back in time. When I was nine years old, a war broke out in my home country, Korea. For three months, during the battle for Seoul City, my whole family was hiding in a hot and humid underground bunker. I was given the sole task of finding food to bring back. To do this, I had to walk about 16 kilometers every day, passing hundreds of dead bodies on the street. To this day, I can precisely remember the horrible stench of the decomposing corpse in those hot summer days. Sometimes a bomber would appear in the sky and I would have to scramble for cover, dropping all the groceries I had collected. For a nine-year-old boy, these were highly traumatic experiences, and they left a permanent mark. I survived the war without much physical injury and went on to study law. I devoted my life to the search for justice and the improvement of society through the rule of law. Ultimately, my work led to the International Criminal Court, which brought me back to the terrible consequences of armed conflict and unrestrained brutality. As president of the ICC, I visited communities affected by atrocities in Uganda and uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I met with former child soldiers and other victims who are now struggling to rebuild their lives. Many of them were uh, missing limbs or had had their ears or nose or lips intentionally cut off. These encounters stir the experience of my childhood. And I ha had to ask myself, how can humans do such a thing one another? Surely, there must be a way to stop such brutality, such madness. There is a way. I strongly believe that the world can change, that human societies can improve. Look at the progress we have made in the last century in the field of education, gender equality, democracy, technology, and healthcare. Time and again, we see that humankind is capable of great advances. But changing the world for the better is hard work. 
In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., I quote, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. The end of the quote. These are words of wisdom. Progress does not occur overnight. Obstacles have to be demolished bit by bit with persistent efforts. It is a long process and may only occasionally culminate in historic breakthroughs when the conditions are right to bear the fruits of arduous labor. The adoption of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court was exactly one such breakthrough. The ICC is a response to the abuse of power and armed forces that has plagued our planet since times immemorial. Throughout history, countless children, women, and men have suffered unspeakable atrocities. Entire populations have been exterminated, expelled, or enslaved. Time after time, armed forces have committed despicable acts of sexual violence, torture, pillage, cruelty under the guise of war have rampaged in every corner of our shared earth. Recog recognition of the potential for barbarism in war is not new, and laws of warfare have developed over the uh, thousands of years from the writings of Sun Tzu in China and the laws of uh, Manu in India. These call for the humane treatment of civilians, prisoners, the sick and wounded. customary laws of war started to take the form of international humanitarian law after the advent of the International Committee of the Red Cross in uh, 1863 and the promulgation of the Libo Code by President Abraham Lincoln the same year. The Libo Code, which instructed to the Union forces on conduct in wartime, subsequently provided much of the basis for the Hague Conventions adopted around the turn of the century. But the horrific events of the Second World War showed that conventions alone were not nearly sufficient. While they created legal undertakings between sovereign states, there was no enforcement mechanism. Furthermore, while treaties provided rules for international warfare, they contained hardly any provisions applicable to internal conflicts or to protect populations from abuse by their own government. To address these deficiencies, the international community adopted fresh legal instruments, including the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the four Geneva Conventions, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Holding some of the main architects of the worst atrocities accountable, 
the Nuremberg and Tokyo tri tribunals laid the foundations for modern international criminal justice. However, these efforts were reactions to criminal acts already committed. The world still lacked a credible mechanism to put leaders on notice that they would be held accountable for future atrocities. The idea of a permanent international criminal court was born. Work on its creation commenced under the auspices of the United Nations but Project Soon fell into oblivion as the Cold War overshadowed all else. Atrocities continued occurring around the globe with few attempts to hold the perpetrators accountable. But the prospect of international criminal justice was too powerful to wither. The proposal to create an international criminal court reemerged at the end of the Cold War and quickly became a powerful movement which gathered civil society, legal communities, and diplomats behind a compelling goal. With astonishing speed, negotiations led to a result that few had thought possible. On the 17th of July, 1998, a multilateral conference convened by the United Nations adopted the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court with 120 votes in favor and only seven votes against. This was an enormous victory, but in the wake of the celebrations, there was marked cautiousness, as most supporters assumed that it would take ages to reach the threshold of 60 state ratifications for the Rome Statute to enter into force. However, to the surprise of all, this happened in less than four years. The ICC was formally created on the 1st of July, 2002, and by the end of 2003, more than half of the world's sovereign states had joined the treaty. This did not signal the end of challenges for the ICC. When the first judges convened in The Hague in early 2003, many of us were seriously wondering whether this new baby court would survive the hostility it was still facing from many quarters, particularly the United States. But the ICC did survive, and today we can safely say the court is here to stay. The Rome Statute now has 122 states parties, and even though major powers such as the US, Russia, and China have not yet joined the treaty, they all fully acknowledge the ICC's important role in international peace and justice. Let me briefly describe some main characteristics of the ICC. First, the crimes under the ICC's jurisdiction are limited to four categories. G, 
genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. In the words of the Rome Statute, they are the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. The definitions of genocide and war crimes were drawn from the existing conventions. As for crimes against humanity, the Rome Statute represents an important advance as it codifies systematic and large-scale crimes against the civilians which had been recognized in different forms over a long time, but were never before laid down in a multilateral convention. The most difficult negotiations took place over the crime of aggression, that is, the illegal use of armed force by one state against another. In the end, the Rome Conference could not reach consensus on aggression and decided to finish the work uh, later. In 2010, the states' parties reconvened and successfully agreed on a definition as well as a jurisdictional rules which have now been ratified by seven states and counting. The second aspect I want to stress is that the ICC is a criminal court. It does not deal with state responsibility like human rights court. And it does not resolve interstate disputes like the International Court of Justice. Instead, the ICC has the power to investigate and prosecute individuals for grave crimes when national jurisdictions fail to do so. This may sound simple, but is in fact a revolutionary development. For the first time, states have agreed to create an international body that has the power to put their own citizens on trial if justice cannot be secured in a national setting. Why is this so important? Well, one of the very reasons for impunity for war crimes and atrocities has been that such crimes were often committed in the context of state-sanctioned war efforts or with the political backing of those in power. States have traditionally been reluctant to prosecute their own people, especially if the crimes in question were a result of abuse of power, lack of control by superiors, or in the worst case, official state policies. Consequently, a country that joins the uh, Rome Statute sends a powerful signal to the rest of the international community, clearly stating we accept to be bound by the principles of international law prohibiting the gravest crimes known to humanity. If any of our nationals commit such acts, we will hold them accountable. And if we fail to do so for any reason, they can be tried in our joint international court, the ICC. What makes this commitment all the more important is that the Rome Statute provides no exceptions based on official capacity. 
Therefore, heads of state that uh, join the Rome stat Statute are at least in theory subjecting themselves to the risk of prosecution by the International Criminal Court. Indeed, the ICC is the only international body with the power to issue an arrest warrant for a sitting head of state. And the all 122 states parties have accepted the obligation in force such a warrant. In two cases before the ICC, the sitting heads of states are facing charges, not because of their function, but despite it. The third aspect of the ICC that I would like to underline is that it is a court of last resort. As a matter of law, the ICC must step back if a competent national jurisdiction is conducting genuine investigation and prosecution of the crimes in question. This principle of complementarity holds the key to much of the Rome Statute's impact on the rule of law. You see, the ICC is built on the very notion that national jurisdictions bear the primary responsibility for the investigation and prosecution of the crimes listed in the Rome Statute. Consequently, the Rome Statute serves as a powerful incentive for the state's parties to incorporate the crimes listed in the statute into their national criminal court. So far, at least 55 states passed the new legislation as they joined the ICC, and draft legislation is pending in at least another 40 countries. In many cases, states had long ago ratified the four Geneva Conventions and the Geno Genocide Convention, but until joining the ICC, had never actually criminalized the acts punishable under those treaties. In this way, the ICC is advancing the rule of law at the national level, increasing legal predictability and compliance with norms that would otherwise only exist in theory. In this way, the Rome Statute uh, state parties are building an interconnected system of international criminal justice woven from national jurisdictions and the ICC. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I believe the ICC's growing membership to be a reflection of the respect that the court has earned so far. Upholding the key principles of independence impartiality and integrity, as well as respect for the highest standards of due process. To date, the ICC has been seized of nine country situations. Five of them were referred to the prosecutor of the ICC by states parties themselves. Two were referred by the United Nations Security Council, and two investigations were initiated at the prosecutor's own initiative with support from national stakeholders. 
the prosecutor of the ICC is also examining allegations of crimes in many other countries. 18 cases have been brought before the ICC involving 31 suspects or accused. The first two trial judgments were issued last year, one conviction and one acquittal, both on charges relating to the use of child soldiers. A historic first decision on reparations for victims was also issued. All of them are now under appeal. The Rome Statute provides an elaborate system of checks and balances to prevent any frivolous proceedings or abuse of the prosecutor's discretionary powers. At all stages, the court follows a rigorous process in which the judges guarantee fairness for all parties and participants. In my view, the ICC's most important effect is deterrence. The likelihood of punishment for the gravest international crimes has grown drastically. Armies around the world are paying increased attention to compliance with international law. And even paramilitary groups and rebel movements are accurately aware of the ICC prosecutor's gaze. As the United Nations Secretary General has stated, the ICC makes an impact by putting would-be violators on notice that impunity is not assured. Obviously, many challenges remain for the evolving Rome Statute system, such as length and cost of proceedings, the cooperation of states with the ICC, and the fact that more than 70 states with the majority of the world population are yet to join the Rome Statute. Numerous states parties still do not have the legal or technical capacity to hold effective trials for ICC crimes. Atrocities continue to occur with impunity in many places around the world, and we must persevere in our tireless efforts to strengthen the international justice system. The force of law must prevail of the law of force. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, by punishing violations of international law and by promoting adherence to these norms, the ICC and the Rome Statute system play an important part in advancing the rule of law. This role is critical given the nature of the crimes that the Rome Statute concerns, crimes which are so heinous, so destructive, that every effort toward their prevention is a moral imperative. We live in an interconnected world with global challenges that require global solutions. The rule of law is a fundamental requirement for progress and the good of humanity. 
I hope to have convinced you of the International Criminal Court's importance in our joint efforts toward that goal. Thank you very much.